know that sand plane therapy is, is a journey, it's a, it's a process. It follows the, the hero's journey that Campbell would tell you more about if he were here today. Sand play is a wonderful modality for working on a non-rational, non-verbal level. And I have found it tremendously useful for children and adults and for people wanting to work with their own creative process. If you've ever experienced walking on a beach, then you know you've got the, the sand beneath you. You've got the land to one side. You've got the ocean and the water to one side. And um, it's um, a liminal world. It is a place in between, yet together all at the same time. It is fluid itself, but yet it is uh, solid. And uh, it behaves in ways that lend itself to expression using our hands. It connects us with nature, it connects us with the ground we walk on, the air we breathe, um, each other, um, and it lends itself to uh, expressive um, maneuvers in the sand. Wow. I'm from a university in Tennessee and I'm studying psychology and so we were asked to kind of job shadow a therapist that covers a realm of therapy we're not that familiar with and I chose sand play. Like you hear the word sand and play and you can kind of make your own idea but I knew that there would be something so much deeper to it and I was just really curious about that. I would say that psyche and body are one, inseparable. And so if you're working with one, you're working with the other. And the beauty of sand play is you're working with both at the same time. So it's a natural channel to tap, particularly for people working with trauma in their life. It is a, an expression. And although it's called play, it's not play in the same way as play therapy. It's not the same as doing batakas or even playing a game or the, that interaction with the therapist that happens so much in play therapy. It's a, it's a um, really an individual technique in many ways. Say it's a three-dimensional art therapy that gets at things that talking can't get to. And it brings up the healing power of the unconscious. Let's well, tray of sand and and you've got all kinds of figures to choose from and so you can create what's going on inside you or outside you whatever or anything else you choose you can create it in the sand by putting the figures together in the sand and you can use dry sand or wet sand. Sand play for me it just every time I do it's just some new discovery and every patient that comes has a very different each very individual kind of presentation in a story or whatever, you know, even the children or the, the elderly people who have the brain syndrome or whatever, you know. Sand play is really based on the Jungian psychology, you know, the analytical psychology, because just like a dream, its focus is the images. And so that's how people express themselves in the symbolic images and also, uh, how do you call, body sense of, you know, felt sense of uh, whatever. I think I would have trouble picking just a few things. Because a lot of things remind me of childhood and then it's, it's like deciding what, what you want to play out. Because so many things remind you of different parts of yourself. And what happens with symbolic language is that when we activate, uh, when we pick up a symbol and we utilize a symbol, a symbol is alive with meaning, as Jung would say. And it, it helps, there's all of these different meanings that it holds, like this flower. It could take me to a wedding, um, it could take me to a graveside, uh, it could take me to a spring day uh, that, that brings back you know, good feelings inside my body. So symbols have multiple meanings. They also hold the tension of the opposites, and 
and they transcend the tension of the opposites because they're so alive with meaning. So when we use symbolic language, it frees us up. We could get so stuck in one pathway. And symbolic language helps us activate many ways of thinking and believing. I understand symbolic language as representing um, archetypes and archetypes are sources of energy that are cross-cultural. They exist in, in many cultures. As a person looks at the figures on the shelf, they're drawn to that archetypal energy, whether it be in an animal, whether it be in a person. <laughs> you know, like a Godzilla and uh, mixed with a Godzilla and a dinosaur, and it has a one horn. And quite often people use this, even the adult. This kind of creature could be more like a monstrous, uh, but it's uh, suffering, like a shadow figure, sort of, from suffering, wanting to become a human, but not quite, you know. <laughs> so this is a, a turtle green turtle with a lily. So this is symbol of um, self. Jung says we all have in the center of our inner conscious, unconscious put together. There is a organizing uh, function that capital S has. So when you see someone do their scene in the sand, how you, as a therapist, how can you tell what's going on in their brain as opposed to their images, or do you even try to understand it? From a Jungian perspective, where I see the ego and the self as connected or disconnected, I see where um, certain issues are trapped, where they're cut off, I see a progression for the most part in most people that are not too traumatized. I see those issues resolving, becoming more integrated so that the personality is more balanced. What we are learning in neuropsychology, Sam Play has known all along and has tapped into this deep healing process that actually changes the brain and integrates the nervous system and brings forth transformative healing. It was through the touching, seeing, doing, the manipulating with the hands and the senses that the individuals were able to tap into body, creative energies, emotions, um, and through these emotional experiences, then they began to think of things they could do differently. It, it went into the cognitive realm. And so this loop goes from, you know, senses to limbic, brainstem up, over into right parietal, then over to the left to, to get, now give meaning and purpose to that sensory experience. And this is how change happens. It's through that uh, sensory system. So in sampling, the multi-sensory experience activates lower centers of the brain that are activating our traumatic response. Then the self-healing response is that inborn journey. It's that inborn capacity that we have to heal ourselves. And so Jung called it the individuation process. And the neurobiology is that while we're seeing that, there is a deep neuro-integration process happening. The brain is integrating. So on a neural level, neurobiological level, that's neural integration. And I think what's most important is the center of the loop, and that's the attuned therapist. That all of this is taking place, not somebody just playing in the sand. This is taking place in the context of relational safety and a generously attuned therapist. Um, how do you typically guide your your sessions? Like, is it something you let, like, I guess, for instance, when we talked about the silent sessions, like, do you say anything or do they just say, you wait for them to say something first? Like, how do you guide a session typically? 
the beauty of the sand play is that they're working not verbally. So it gives them a chance to be more focused about what's going on inside them versus talking, because I think the talking takes them away. This technique that comes from the inside rather than coming from the outside. And the, the, the practice of listening is the way that we can listen on all those levels. They're always present with us, but we're finally beginning to be able to think about them. There is a, a dimension that the nonverbal work brings that I think enhances one's own pursuit of one's own individuation process. When you make the descent into doing that depth work, you've got to keep an anchor. You've got to stay grounded, and that's, that's largely um, the role of the therapist to, to hold and anchor you so you don't get lost. It's a very different experience to be doing it witnessed by someone who is with you. It's about the, that re relational holding so that we're not only, we're grounding ourselves, we're connecting with being in ourselves in order to connect with that in the other. So it's like my connection to the self or being connects with your connection to the self and being. The self, which is of course the center of the universe, the internal center of us, that gets to have a part. How much do you read into the fact that it's it's a form of raw, like I say raw therapy, as in it's literally saying it like from the earth. Um, so do you, do you feel like that has a huge component or do you think mostly us being able to use our own imagination is a bigger draw to the therapy? As soon as someone uses their hands to reach for a symbol on a shelf, there's an action and a reaction to that piece, that symbol in itself. And then when they take it in a secondary way into the sand, they're taking it into another sensate environment. And I really do think from their fingers in their hand and then to the sand becomes a very energetic experience. It's not something you know with your head, but you feel it in your heart very deeply and you're touched and that's the healing. For children it oftentimes releases a sense of spontaneity back into their lives, a relaxed state of being, a place to work out maybe inner conflicts. For adults who perhaps are carrying a level of trauma or a level of conflict they're able to see it in a more externalized way and to be able to actually begin to work with it in a way that allows them to feel they have either more control or a new way of seeing something or making something can happen in a different way than what their previous experiences have been. If someone brings symbols, images to the sand, then what does it begin to feel like, look like? How does that begin to kind of move in them and in the room? I can see that there's a level of movement that kind of begins to constellate in their sense of being, in their outward world, and they're being carried on the unconscious in a different way as well. In other words, maybe what they used a month ago isn't what they might use a month later, but there's something that's kind of growing, moving, changing. There's not a static held place. It begins to release. In other words, our unconscious, whatever we define it as, or wherever things come from, have a way of coming up into to an enlivened state. They have to cross over into this place that we're holding, which is a sand tray, and they have to kind of come into life there. And that crossing over place is what I think is as the metaphorical kind of bridge between the unconscious and the conscious. And when that can come forth, I think there's a healing moment in that.
And so sand clay is so dynamic. It allows us to use our hands um, and our intellect and our psyche and our soul to work together jointly to solve our problems, uh, to figure out uh, where we need to grow in life. The sand play um, allows the child to uh, reach a depth within his own being. I had an amazing process with a four-year-old and this little girl ended up in foster care. Uh, this little girl had a fascination uh, and passion for birds. So I had to go get more and more and more birds for the collection. And she would make these amazing mounds and cover them with birds and she would see very bright and she would say at age four, it's a bird sanctuary. You've found a safe haven for the time being while mommy's in rehab. And then there was the process of, of uh, you know, her mother's uh, work. This little child continued to make these similar formations. They were a little bit messier, not quite so neat. And the next thing I knew, she was saying to me, um, they're migrating. So she migrated back to her mother. And that containment, that household was a little messier. But she was happy. It, it's really magic. And uh, the power of it is unbelievable. Because a child under 12 years of age cannot come in usually and tell me how they're feeling. They could talk about what's going on, like there's a divorce happening or um, they're upset at school. But in terms of accessing their feelings, the words just don't do it for children. Just have to be with the child and be with them non-verbally. And I think we don't put enough emphasis, and I think I learned this from Darkhoff, making space for the child on a nonverbal level, feeling with them, sensing with them through my own body, through my own feelings, not having to say a lot, but in that nonverbal place, that's where the work, the healing happens. And I recommend Sampley because it's a natural way for children to express their, their most horrific feelings, and it also gives them an opportunity to discover what's inside that they may not know, have a clue. When I was working in uh, nursery school settings uh, as a consultant, I was seeing three, four, and five-year-old children just kind of oozing uh, information into their beings with uh, use of the sand and water play uh, table. And uh, even at that point, I was thinking, this is a perfect medium for communication and exploration. So many uh, children and adults that I've worked with were traumatized at an early age, and some were very much pre-verbal. And so they were not able to uh, express it in any other way until they got to this modality. Um, but what I wanted to figure out was who started it? Like whose idea was it to start doing therapy in this way? Dora Kolf, the originator of Sandley, lived in Switzerland. Carl Jung had a very strong indirect connection. Carl Jung and Emma Jung became friendly with Dora Kolf. He told her one day that he had heard a woman by the name of Margaret Lowenfeld give a lecture in London about these small miniatures, and he was very taken by her work. Dora made connection to Lowenfeld. She went to spend an entire year studying with Margaret Lowenfeld. Fast forward, she became involved with Jungian psychology, got involved in the training program, the Jungian training program. So she had a very, very strong base, Jungian base. And then she leaned very heavily on Eric Neumann, and she used his three phases of development to understand what was going on in the trays. In one of her trips to Japan, 
she had met Suzuki and she was very influenced by his spiritual thought and that led her on to the Tibetan monks. Silence was really important to evoke a deeper self, a deeper connection to the work. Kalf watched and let it evolve and felt that to speak much and to interpret much would interfere with the connection with one's own instincts, self, inner world. She was a real human person who had the gift of putting something together that we all treasure. I mean, I'd say the most valuable piece that I got from Dara Kolf is this place of nonverbal holding. She had this kind of trust about holding a free and protected space. As she um, validated and respected the unconscious and the power of the unconscious to heal. There's a presence and a being with that I think is profound that we learn as Sam play therapist. And that is something that I really treasure about the Sam play community, is the real transmission of the tradition. But she wove together all these elements. The Tibetan Buddhism piece that she wove in is more around the silence and trusting the silence and that things will come to people in such a space. So not to give the answers, but to create a place where people might discover their own answers. Then the, um, the Jungian part is really interwoven throughout. You know, the self, um, all the theory we learn and see enacted, the transcendent function. There would be no sand play if there had not been Margaret Lohenfeld and the world technique. Dora Kolf went to study and learn about it, and then she took and was inspired by that and made it her own. Sounded like the roots started in the children realm. When did it shift into adult? And she says about that that when the parents began to see the, the shifts in the children, the changes in the children, they became more and more curious about the sand play. Then she went with that, and so it's become now uh, a modality used with any age person. Um, because when you deeply engage in this work, it changes you. It changes how you live your life. I think it's uh, a feeling of being comfortable in your life. It's a feeling of saying I have had the courage to confront things in my life that otherwise might not have been worked on. And I haven't had to use words to make myself understood. I've been able to use symbols and images. And I think that actually helps people feel a sense of wholeness, if we could call it that. But at the, in the largest, most pragmatic way, if people feel that they have more comfort and room and peacefulness and a more compassionate stance towards themselves, I think that's a gift that they've given themselves. Um. How did you go about getting certified to do this? Is there a special school that you go to or? I think if you're going to be a sand play therapist, you have to have a sand play process that you yourself have really enjoyed. And then I think the most important thing, without doubt, is just doing our own deep sand play process. It's pretty cool. You can't take anybody where you haven't gone. You need to actually have your own sand play process and do the process and experience the process. And that gives you more information than any class. Then you, you know, learn some didactic and do some of this other, you know, training that we have. Well, consultation is the secondary part of really good training. And the nice thing now with being able to be on the computers and Skyping, you can talk to people. I can talk to people in Hong Kong. I can talk to people in Australia. You can be online and actually share case study and discuss case work and have incredible interactions on a global level today that are very effective. 
Well, I think one of the best ways is to be in a consultation group because you get not only to see your cases, but you get to see other cases, other sampling collections, other pa patients that, than your own. And we're in a world now where so much is pushed on us and we're really imposed upon by things. And our consultation rooms are places where people can breathe. Our organization, the Sample Therapists of America, is about, our, our mission is to train therapists in this modality. Yeah, there's, there's regional groups, there's national groups, there's international groups. So lots, there's going to be more and more training around than there ever was. Sample Therapy Institute is wonderful. Uh, you can do some very concentrated training, if you don't, especially if you don't have much in your area. So the Sample Institute is available for um, uh, very in-depth and intensive training. Um, we also have um, uh, every other year in between uh, years that the conference is held, we have other um, regional trainings, large regional trainings available as well. Everybody who is a member of STA is also a member of the international organization. So the International Society for Sample Therapy really began with good representation from all parts of the world to begin with, from Japan, Germany, Switzerland, England, the United States, Hawaii. They brought their cases to Switzerland and literally really were the founding group that began to hold the idea that this modality should have a legitimate holding and that an international society would be a way to hold it. The Sample Therapists of America organization who sponsors the journal um, that is put out twice a year and includes uh, wonderful um, um, articles about sampling cases and uh, history. There are also regional and state organizations and many training groups that are, are all over the country. I have a list of places where people can learn about sampling therapy and that would include, of course, any local organizations, but of course, Sample Therapists of America, the International Society for Sample Therapy. So any of those organizations are going to be your best resource to find certified therapists, teachers, workshops that are going on. Almost from the beginning, uh, Sample Therapists of America have been interested in research, showing that Sample, in fact, makes a difference in people's lives, that that deals with their issues and problems. And we do have quite a bit of outcome research. And then we also have quite a bit of process research. And the process is looking at what, ha what happens in the trays, what goes on in the trays to understand the trays. But in Japan, we is, is the format, in a sense. It's not I only. So of course we do I, but also deal with a group setting. And it's important to understand the group uh, play something, Hakoniwa. Or I go to the disaster area for the sandal play. This was most helpful. Group Hakoniwa was most helpful. There's a tool here that folks can use if you're three or 63 at your own pace to in a way that you know, the knowing is there. So they go where they're stuck and they work it through. And Sample has that to offer.